Hello, Jaffies. I hope you guys have been having some happy studying and I hope you guys are finding our resources to be continually useful. And uh, if that's not the case, we really would love to hear from you guys. We're just here to try and give you the best material that we can in as helpful a way as we can. Without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna be walking you guys through some microbiology. So today we're gonna to be looking at uh, what these uh, microbes that are clinically relevant are, how to control them. We're looking a little bit at uh, the different types of core infections from bacteria, viruses, and parasites. We'll leave fungi for another day. So to start with, let's break it down into the three domains of life. We've got bacteria, we've got archaea, and we've got eukarya. Now, uh, you may not have heard of archaea before. They used to think it was really ancient, but now they know that it's actually probably closely related to, more closely related to eukaryotes than to bacteria, which is not what they originally thought. Now, in eukaryotes, we've got animals, we've got fungi, we've got plants, and we've also got things called protozoans. So things like amoebas, uh, these uh, ciliates, and all kinds of little things uh, that are just kind of unicellular eukaryotic cells usually. Uh, in bacteria, well, we've got bacteria, as you probably guessed, and archaea are very, very similar to bacteria, uh, but they don't usually cause disease. In fact, there's not really much evidence to suggest that they do cause disease in any case. They do form a small part of our gut microbiota. So what is a microbe? Now I've got here that it's a microorganism or a virus that causes disease. Doesn't necessarily have to cause disease though. So we can also have beneficial microbes such as our natural gut microbiota. But today we're gonna to focus on the pathogenic ones. So we've got three main groups of those being bacteria, some eukaryotes, so we've got fungi and protozoans. We're only gonna look briefly at protozoans today. And then we've got viruses. And there's a very, very small amount of archaea, as I said, in our natural gut flora, but they haven't been shown to cause disease. So here's a little just idea of what kind of sizes we're talking about here. So red blood cells are kind of on the smaller side of our human cells, about seven to eight micrometers in diameter. E. coli is a large bacteria, so it's fairly close in, in its length to the diameter of the red blood cell. But then as you can see, we've got much, much smaller bacteria, such as the Rickettsia genus. Now, pox virus is a huge virus. It's one of the only ones that is, some say, visible under light microscopy. Uh, but most viruses are not. You need an electron microscope. They're about, you know, smaller by a factor of 10 at least. Um, so very, very small. All right, let's have a look. So eukaryotic pathogens. These are just some important ones I've listed and kind of their general, uh, what, what they generally cause. So we've got plasmodium, uh, which causes malaria. Uh, specifically plasmodium falciparum, this causes the most severe form. Giardia lamblia causes giardiasis, which is a common cause of traveler's diarrhea. And we've got amoebas cause amoebic dysentery. They can cause other things as well, but this is a common one, uh, or at least the classic one. Uh, then with fungi, probably the most important one to know about is candida albicans, causes oral or genital thrush which is that white kind of uh, not very nice to look at buildup that you can get in your mouth or in your genitals. Now it usually happens post antibiotics or it can happen in immunosuppressed individuals. So HIV patients um, uh, will often have increased susceptibility to candida. Then there's aspergillus, which causes aspergillosis, uh, which is a, it's kind of a class of mainly lung diseases can also cause upper resp infections, uh, but it's especially scary if you have aspergillus pneumonia. All right, so we've got bacteria now. Let's have a look at this. This is probably the chunkiest section of today. Uh, they can be classed in a few different ways. I've got here cell wall type and aerobic anaerobic status. They can also be classed on their shape, but I don't think that's as clinically important because it doesn't really tell us how to kill them. Cell wall type can help us kill them. So there's gram positives and gram negatives. You might've heard of this before. Gram positives is like your staph, strep, and clostridium are probably the three most common ones that I can think of. These are the names that are probably thrown around the most. And I've got the kind of the most common gram negative names that I think are thrown around a lot as well down here. And then some bacteria don't fit the bill for either of these. Uh, and the most notable example is easily tuberculosis, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Oops, sorry. Then we've got um, aerobic anaerobic status. The vast majority of bacteria uh, that cause disease are facultative anaerobes. So uh, the only exceptions to that that are really common would be Clostridium and uh, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis. So what does it mean to be gram positive or gram negative? Well, I always remember it, first of all, by how they look under the microscope. And then we'll talk about the cell wall structure. 
So gram positive has purple peptidoglycan. Okay, we'll talk about what peptidoglycan is and why um, you know why that's important momentarily. But you can see in this slide here that the gram positive bacteria are a distinct dark shade of purple. This is because Graham was a dude who came up with a staining technique for bacteria that either turns them purple, in which case they're positive, or which turns them red, in which case they're negative. Some people say they're pink, I say they're red. Now, the reason I say they're red is because it helps me with my mnemonic, because red is like, eh -ow, bow -bow, wrong, cross. You kind of think of a red X when you think of this. So now let's have a look at uh, the differences in structure between gram negative and gram positive bacteria. So the reason it goes purple is that gram stains, there's a chemical in them which strongly adheres to this um, outer membrane of gram positive bacteria. And this outer membrane is a thick layer of peptidoglycan. So um, it turns them purple very, very readily. Compared to gram negative bacteria, which have a thin layer of peptidoglycan, but an outer membrane, which is not peptidoglycan. Consequently, um, we have a lot of antibiotics that target this peptidoglycan in order to kill bacteria. So our penicillins and cephalosporins, which you may learn about uh, in the near future. Uh, so they are very good against gram positives, therefore, because they've got thick peptidoglycan, uh, but they're not as good as on gram negatives because gram negatives have that extra outer membrane to protect them as well. So let's have a look at some of the other defenses that bacteria have. So we know that bacteria are prokaryotes, which means they have this big nucleoid in the center, and then they have some small circular plasmids of DNA as well, um, but they don't have any membrane-bound organelles. All they have is little ribosomes floating around, which are not membrane-bound. But they have some other external features that we should look at. So they sometimes have this thick blue part here called a capsule. It doesn't look blue under a microscope, but uh, it, it, it's just illustrated so. This is sometimes called the glycocalyx, but it's also known as the capsule. And it's a very, very thick layer of carbohydrates designed to protect against phagocytosis, but it also stops the bacteria from drying out. Then we've got uh, flagella. Sometimes bacteria have more than one of these. They're very distinct from eukaryotic flagella because they're made of flagellin instead of tubulin. So remember, in eukaryotic cells, we have the 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules, which are made of tubulin proteins. Well, here we don't have that arrangement and we have a different protein, which means flagella can be a target for uh, antibiotics or antimicrobials. Then we have these pili and fimbriae, which are similar in structure, but they do different things. So fimbriae cells have lots of them and they're designed to stick to things and pili are designed to stick to things as well, but in a different way. We'll talk about that in a moment. Finally, we've got spores. Not all bacteria make spores, but the ones that do, they're basically like putting out a whole bunch of seeds and these seeds are really hard to kill. So um, they, they're resistant against drying out. Uh, you need higher temperatures to kill them. And basically they're like a dormant form of bacteria that can reactivate uh, once the environment is favorable. So killing bacteria may not be too hard uh, comparatively, but you need to remember that you need to kill all the spores as well. So it, it can be really, really challenging. Now, briefly, we'll look at pili and fimbriae. Fimbriae, you can see these little hair-like projections here, and they're designed to stick to other bacteria or to uh, external parts of the environment, whether animate or inanimate. So they can stick to host cells or they can stick to surfaces. And this enables them to persist for a long time there. And there's lots of fimbriae per bacteria. But then there's pili. There's only a couple of these. They're a lot longer and kind of thicker. And basically, this is as close as bacteria get to a sex organ. And remember those circular plasmids we were looking at here? Well, pili are designed to transmit plasmids between bacteria. So let's say this bacterium here actually has, uh, the one with all the fimbriae labeled, actually has a plasmid that is antibiotic resistant. Well, then it could transmit that antibiotic, resistant path, uh, that antibiotic resistant plasmid or a copy of it down to this other bacteria down here. And that would make this bacterium now also antibiotic resistant. So they can actually evolve much faster thanks to this kind of, uh, thanks to this almost kind of sexual reproduction mechanism that they have. Uh, now let's have a quick look at bacterial replication. The most important thing to know about this is that it's not mitosis. It's a little bit different. There's no uh, anaphase, metaphase, all that kind of stuff. We don't have chromosomes lining up on the metaphase plate. They simply duplicate their central chromosome. Uh, they you know, try and duplicate it, uh, the plasmids as well. And then they just divide in half 
with one half having one chromosome and the other having another. So you get two identical daughter cells in essence. Uh, very, very simple, uh, almost primitive procedure. Now the most clinically important bacteria I've put in this table, I won't go through all of them, but uh, staph and strep are names you're gonna hear all the time. Sometimes, in fact, a lot of the time, they infect similar tissues, so they can do soft tissue infection. They're both known for something called necrotizing fasciitis in the media. Uh, sorry, necrotizing fasciitis scientifically, in the media they often call it flesh-eating bacteria. Um, so if you're unfamiliar, I don't recommend Googling. It's quite a horrible site unless you're, uh, I guess, particularly curious for, for that. But uh, yeah, necrotizing fasciitis can be caused by both of these guys, but classically it's from strep pyogenes. Now, strep pyogenes usually causes that, uh, like a sore throat is kind of the typical defining factor of strep pyogenes infection. Uh, but that can later lead to scarlet fever, which is a very serious condition. Clostridioides difficile. Uh, or difficile, people pronounce it all different ways, uh, is the main cause of nosocomial diarrhea. Nosocomial meaning hospital acquired. Then we've got E. coli causes UTIs, makes sense because E. coli comes from the colon and that's basically means that it's in your feces. So your poo-poo hole is unfortunately a little bit close to your pee-pee hole. So sometimes a little bit of poo-poo bacteria gets into your pee-pee hole and you get a UTI, no fun at all. E. coli can also cause diarrhea in there. Salmonella, food poisoning, Neisserium meningitidis, meningococcal, which is the most serious form of meningitis, and Haemophilus influenzae is kind of one that's thrown around a lot, but thrown around a lot, but we never really learn it in a huge amount of detail. Uh, I just took this, this piece of information here from your slides. Now let's have a look at viruses. They're not alive, but they can really, really mess you up. So one virus particle we call a virion, and a virion is composed of a few uh, main kind of anatomical features. Outside, in some of them, so it's an optional feature, is this green layer here on the image called an envelope. And if it is there, it's gonna be the communication between the inside and inside world of the virus and the outside world. So this communicates with your host cell. Then we've got the capsid. Now, if the envelope is not present, then this is what's communicating with the outside world. And it contains all the virus's genetic material. Now, viruses can have either RNA or DNA. Uh, and depending on which one they are, determines kind of different ways that they can use to replicate. And finally, inside the capsid as well, they've got these little tools called, well, we, we know what enzymes are. But these enzymes are acting as tools to help the virus uh, basically hijack the cells. So let's have a look at the five steps of virus replication. First, the virus has to come along to the host cell. Viruses need a host cell to replicate. They cannot replicate without a host cell, and that's why we don't consider them to be alive usually. So along comes the virus, it attaches to the cell. It does this either by binding with the envelope to the cell membrane, or it binds the capsid to the cell membrane. In this case, we've got an envelope virus. The virus gets endocytose, that's entry. So it's now inside the host cell, it sheds its envelope, and now the capsid wants to bring the, the, the genetic material into the nucleus so that the cell will replicate the, the virus for it. So it travels to the nucleus, and what it does is it incorporates that genetic material inside the capsid with the host cell's genetic material, which you can kind of see in this diagram here. And once it does that, the host cell if it hasn't worked out that it's infected with a virus yet, it will proceed to transcribe and translate its genome as normal. And now that there's viral components to that genome, it's gonna be producing viral proteins as well as normal proteins. So now there's a whole bunch of viral proteins floating around in the, in the human cell. And these viral proteins, all they have to do is assemble into a new virion, and there can be thousands of new virions forming as a result of this process. And then these new virions just have to be released from the cell. So they do this process called budding here. And this is a diagram, I think, of HIV replication. Uh, depending on if it's an, uh, an RNA or a DNA virus, it will do things slightly differently. And it will have different tools in order to accomplish that. Here are some of the most important viruses. Probably the most important ones to know about in a little bit of detail would be HIV, uh, rotavirus and norovirus. Uh, and probably herpes viruses as well. Um, this is because these are kind of, I would, I would say the main buzz, buzzword viruses for preclin years. All right, let's get on to why we need to control microbes. Now, 
in a hospital setting, it's because we're really, really worried about nosocomial infections. This is hospital acquired infections. And the reason we worry about nosocomial infections is one, that they're kind of really bad. Two, they happen a lot. So it's considered to be the most common complication experienced by patients in Australian hospitals and in a lot of hospitals around the world. Uh, and finally, if, if we you know, do proper practice, a lot of nosocomial infections really are avoidable by simple uh, hygienic practices. So let's have a look at the chain of infection. And we'll profile one bacterium according to how it uh, infects people uh, and what all these different parts are for that pathogen. So the etiologic agent is kind of like the pathogenic agent. In this case, it's going to be C. difficile, which is a gram-positive anaerobe. Now, the reservoir for that, uh, Clostridium bacteria can live in the soil or they can live you know, on general surfaces as well in, in the natural environment, but they often reside in human intestines in low numbers as well. Uh, now, the way they get out, if they're in human intestines, of course, is via excretion, especially if they're in an infected individual. They can be excreted and the, the feces can therefore be quite contaminated with C. difficile. Now, the transmission is this fecal oral route. This fecal oral route is uh, something you'll hear about a lot. It's one of the most common modes of transmission for bacteria, especially enteric bacteria. Then we've got the portal of entry, and of course, that's by mouth. Fecal oral route tells you it goes in the mouth. And finally, the susceptible host of this is humans. Now, the reason we need to know this is because for certain pathogens, we can basically attack different parts of this chain to try and stop the infection. So for instance, if we stop the mode of transmission of C. difficile, of C. difficile by washing our hands rigorously and every single time that we see a patient or every single time that a patient goes to the bathroom, well, we can seriously uh, diminish the likelihood of Clostridium difficile transmission. So what are the different hygiene practices that we have for infection control? Well, the first is cleaning, which is basically removing organic and inorganic contaminants from things. The next is disinfecting, which is basically killing the most of the microbes on a surface or object. And then sterilizing means we have to kill every last thing, including spores. So disinfecting, you may leave some spores, but sterilizing, you have to kill everything. Uh, now, we can't sterilize everything, unfortunately. It's not practical. Uh, there's certain methods which would be kind of destructive to certain pieces of equipment. And finally, uh, it's just not practical because pathogens are everywhere. And things that are sterilized, they don't say sterilized for long. But some things, it's unavoidable. We have to do it. So let's have a look at the things that we can do. So what are the main cleaning practices we would use in a hospital or in a, or in a practice? Well, one of them is to use soap to wash your hands if they're visibly soiled. Another would be to wash used or soiled linen. And of course, let's say you have a blood spill or something where you need to remove uh, that spill or that contaminant uh, from medical equipment, from the floor, from things like that. But other than that, it's, it's basically ensuring that there's not excessive visible contaminants uh, around the working environment. Now, disinfecting practices are looking at things that are not visible. So we're looking at bacteria and things like that. So we can do physical disinfection. Uh, the most basic form of this would be to boil objects. So put them in boiling water. And boiling water is pretty hot, so it kills most things, but it doesn't usually kill bacterial spores. We've got chemical disinfection. This is probably the most common practice. We have to chemically disinfect our hands all the time. And the ideal solution for that is a 60 to 80% alcohol solution. Uh, and we use this for hand rub. It's very useful because it evaporates and it is also very effective for killing lots and lots of bacteria. And the one that we use in ClinSkills, uh, which of course you guys may not be familiar with because you, you haven't been able to do ClinSkills in person, is a 2% chlorhexidine, 70% alcohol solution. We also have alcohol wipes for things like stethoscopes that need to touch people's skin. We use iodine for surgical site preparation. And then uh, disinfectants that we use around the house, for instance, to clean surfaces, are usually what we call phenolic disinfectants. So we can't use these on skin. Now, we do have some sterilizing practices for really important pieces of equipment that are used in invasive procedures. So we have an autoclave, and this is basically like a pressure cooker that really, really heats up the equipment in question. Now, the faculty seems to love that uh, to, seems to love making you guys know the temperatures and the durations of autoclave, uh, sorry, of autoclave cycles. So the most common cycle, the, the standard cycle is 121 degrees. It uses steam, by the way, 121 degrees steam for 15 minutes. 
Uh, you can also use a 134 degree steam cycle for just three and a half minutes uh, to much the same result. Now, um, we can also use dry heat to sterilize things. Uh, sometimes it's an autoclave just on a dry setting. Sometimes you need a separate device. Now, dry heat takes a lot longer to physically sterilize things because it doesn't transmit energy as well as steam. That's why you burn really easily with steam, but you can put your hand in a hot oven and uh, as long as you don't touch the metal, you might not burn your hand. So for, with dry heat, you need a 160 degree um, oven and you need to expose the, the, uh, the item to it for two hours and 170 degrees is one hour. Uh, now we also use chemical sterilization. So we can use ethylene oxide gas or we can use these glutaraldehyde or formaldehyde solutions, but these guys are really toxic. So we can't use them on humans, obviously, uh, for much the same reason uh, that we can't put humans in an autoclave. Uh, but we do need chemical sterilization for lots of equipment. There's lots of like plastic or rubbery equipments that you can't really put in an autoclave because they would burn. So for instance, catheters, which are, and specifically we're usually talking about intravenous catheters here, which you know, would go into your radial or brachial artery and go all the way through your arteries into your heart. Well, these catheters uh, need to be very, very sterile because they come, they come in direct contact with your blood. So we chemically sterilize these. We also do it for uh, urinary catheters because urinary catheters uh, are associated with a huge uh, burden of nosocomial infection. In fact, urinary tract infections, often secondary to, um, to catheterization, are uh, the most common cause of, uh, uh, sorry, are the most common type of nosocomial infection. And finally, you need to know your hand hygiene. So there's five moments, as you know, now, the way I always remember it is I remember it two before and afters and one after. So before and after touching a patient, before and after a procedure, and then after touching the patient's surrounding. And it kind of makes sense, but it's, I'm not kidding when I say this is probably the most consequential thing that you will learn in all of your preclin years. It's, it's so important. If we didn't have good hand hygiene, modern medicine just wouldn't be where it is today. And just remember the most important, uh, the, the other important component is not only when you do it, but what you do it with. So you need to do it with good, uh, with a good 70% alcohol solution, sometimes with chlorhexidine added. And then finally, we have some other anti-infective practices that we use. So um, one of the common ones is prophylactic antibiotics, especially sometimes in immunosuppressed patients uh, and the eye or, or sometimes before surgery. And um, the reason we do this is because um, we know that the risk of nosocomial infection is high and we would really like to avoid it if we can. But prophylactic antibiotics are also sometimes not desirable because they could be contributing to antibiotic resistance. And then of course we have quarantine and uh, I'm sure we're all very familiar with this. Uh, it's not, it's not, a, not a lot of fun for the people involved, but it is a pretty good way to stop disease spread because ultimately disease spreads when people who are infected get in contact with other people who are infected, uh, whether directly or indirectly. That's all I have for you guys. I hope that was helpful. Jaffies, um, I'm going to take you guys through bacteria and viruses now. Um, so I'm not sure how this content was delivered to you guys this year, but last year I remember it was an active learning session with um, two really content heavy pre-learning slides, like each document was like 40 something pages. So um, I took most of my notes from there, I guess, but I kind of like condensed it. I'm just going to take you guys through the important bits. Yeah, so we're going to start off with, um, I guess, like the body's normal flora so you know that the body's yeah has a really diverse um, normal flora but it's also important to realize that a lot of body sites are sterile so they're actually non-found or non should be found and if it is found it's a bad sign yeah so I guess um, I have a few examples from the internet here and the important ones I think that they want you to know is the lower respiratory tract and the upper urethra and if you're a hard time remembering um, if it's the lower or the upper part for these two things, just think whichever is closest to the, I guess, your midline is the one that should be clean. And something else is an oppor opportunistic pathogen. So there are a lot of microorganisms that are usually commensal, so it means it just resides in your body, but it doesn't cause you any harm. But in some instances, such as when your immunity is low, um, they can infect you and cause some serious infections. Okay, and then there are just some differences between bacteria and viruses. I'm not going to go into detail for any, um, for any of those because this is all like high school bio. It's really simple stuff. Okay, so now we're going to start with bacteria um, and just the normal flora of the body. So 
yeah, there's bacteria found in just about every um, different part of the body. And so, um, I guess I won't go into this much detail. You guys can just read this in your own time. I mean, most of this is stuff from the pre-learning anyway. But yeah, so the skin is relatively dry. It's slightly acidic. Um, dead cells are a source of nutrition for these bacteria, And there are also moist areas in the body, such as the armpit or like between your toes, where different kinds of bacteria can grow. So yeah, they're mostly gram positives. And also below the skin surface, there are all these different glands. And you can find um, the bacteria that causes acne there. And for the nose and oral cavity, um, these bacteria must be tougher as there's mechanical removal, such as like you blowing your nose and stuff like that. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, gram positives and gram negatives. And yeah. Um, so I should mention that for all of these, um, she gave you a lot of examples. And I guess th there's no need to memorize all of them. It's just you'll see a lot of them over time. And I think in the second semester, you'll learn more about like bacterial and viral pathogenesis. And there's just there's a lot of repetition, and that's how you like eventually um, memorize some of these, or like get to know some of these. And now in the mouth, um, the saliva and food that you eat are all new sources of nutrients for these bacteria. But um, the saliva also contains antibacterial substances such as lysosomes, and these um, make it difficult for some bacteria to grow. And so orga organisms must attach to surfaces such as your gums and teeth to resist the flushing action of your saliva. That's why it's important to brush your teeth to get rid of them in these surfaces. And then on your teeth as well, there's stuff that's like um, attached to it. And they normally are anchored to your teeth with this like polysaccharide matrix. So to form something called like a biofilm, um, which you'll learn about more. But it's basically like these bacteria like are so sticky that they kind of um, form a film around your teeth. And then there's the respiratory tract. So there's the upper and the lower. So the lower is supposed to be sterile, and it's because it has this like mucosal ciliary um, staircase. So the, in the epithelium, epithelial cells, um, there's cilia, and they secrete mucus, and then they kind of like propel all the bacteria upwards to, towards your mouth to flush it out. And there are also macrophages um, in the alveolus of your tongue that gets rid of all these like bacteria. But on the other hand, on the upper respiratory respiratory tract, you can find gram positives, um, cocci, bacilli, gram negative cocci. Yeah, all of this stuff is, is not that important to um, memorize at this point at all. It's just, I guess, for like an understanding. Yeah, and then there's a bunch of other examples they gave you that, um, that are found in different parts of the tract. Yeah, and for the stomach, so you should know that the stomach is a really hostile environment because it's very acidic. Um, it's got a pH of like 2. Um, yeah, so in the gastric mucosa, you can actually find some um, microorganisms that can actually tolerate this acidity. Um, yeah, and peptic ulcer disease is caused by something called um, Helicobacter pylori, and apparently it's found in like half of the human population or something, but in some people they can cause peptic ulcers. Yeah, um, and then in, in your gastrointestinal tract, so as the pH increases, um, further further away from the stomach, of course, the bacterial numbers increase because then the environment is easier for them to grow. So in the small intestine, um, there's also bio and pancreatic secretions for digestions that also kind of inhibit the growth of some bacteria. But yeah, so numbers increase from your duodenum to your jejunum to the ileum. And yeah, but ileum is towards the end of your small intestine. Therefore, you're expected to have kind of like a similar environment as your large intestine. So um, it's kind of similar to the colon with many gram positives and gram negatives. In your large intestine, there is a lot of bacteria, apparently. Um, there's over 400 different types, and they make up 30% of your fecal volume. Yeah, these are just some examples. And they're actually strictly anaerobic because I guess there's no oxygen that can be found there. So yeah, so yeah many gram negatives, but um, also some gram positives. Oops, this negative wasn't meant to be there. Yeah. Um, and then in your genital urinary tract, so the upper tract, the, the tract, the part that's closer to um, your insides, I guess, like your kidney and your upper urethra, um, they're usually sterile. But in, in the lower urethra, it's a different case. And especially in females, um, you have organisms from the skin, the vagina, or the colon. And mo the, these are mostly um, flushed out by like um, the urine, but Sometimes, especially, um, E. coli can persist and cause UTIs. So yeah, UTIs are mostly always um, caused by E. coli. 
um, in, your, in your vagina. It's very co complex. And the most abundant is lactobacilli. And they, these are just all responsible for maintaining the pH of the vagina and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and apparently the bladder has, um, research has shown that it has its own microbiota as well. Okay, now we're going to look at the disease process um, of bacteria. So um, there are different states, um, I guess, between a bacteria and the host. So usually there's a balance in our body between these bacteria trying to attack us and our defense. So we keep it down, right? But sometimes um, an infection can arise from either opportunistic pathogens, so stuff that's already in our body, uh, microbes already in our body, but they suddenly find a way to attack because our immunity is low or something like that. Or it could just be some microbes that we acquire from the environment. So I guess something that we catch. And then here's some terminology. So pathogen is just a microbe that has the potential to cause disease in us. And pathogenicity is the ability of it to cause disease. Virulence is the, is the measure of the pathogenicity and the virulence factor is stuff, different things expressed by pathogens to help them to cause the disease. And yeah, so there's a steps of, um, of an infectious disease and diseases. Um, yeah, so it's existing, reservoir, um, mode of transmission, means of entry, and host susceptibility. So this is all stuff that's going to come up again um, next time, so don't worry about too much. Yeah, so the thing that sets pathogens apart from our normal flora is that they have to express virulence determinants and these um, can help them do different things such as adhesions like sticking to our own cells, sticking to the host cells to um, damage them or sometimes they have capsules that make it hard for them to be phagocytos or some even um, secrete like endotoxins, exotoxins that can damage our body. Yeah, so to establish um, disease, the pathogen must enter the body it must colonize our body, it has to evade our host immunity defenses, multiply and disseminate, and then cause damage to the host. And yeah, so um, there are many different sources of infection, um, sources of infection, and for it to leave the body to shed. And yeah, so it can be inanimate, so fo food, soil, water, or fomites. Fomites are just like objects that are contaminated with um, microbes, such as like hospital equipment, stuff like that, or like... Um, say like in the school maybe like the toys of kids and stuff like that um yeah and then it could be animate so they can be a animals is known as zoonosis 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 and then insects and or like just humans just us yeah so in order for a pathogen to infect our body it must develop a way to bypass our epithelial layer and it must also have a way to exit our body and transmit it to the next host so yeah these are all like the different portals of entry or exit and our bodies um, obviously have our own um, barriers to entry, so this is all stuff that we covered in immunology, so I'm not going to go into too much detail, but some examples are like the skin, um, it has high so and fatty acids, so it's kind of slightly acidic, the stomach's very acidic, um, the lower res respiratory tract, like I said, has mucus and cilia, or in the stomach, there's um, peristalsis, and in some of these places we'll find like lysozymes and stuff like that, and then of course there's our innate and adaptive immune responses. And this is just a picture showing all the different types of transmission um, of diseases. Yeah, um, I think they're all really obvious, so I'm not going to go into detail. Okay, so bacteria can enter our body through different areas, such as our skin, um, such as if we breathe it in, um, such as fecal-oral transmission, so that's when we, like, we have to ingest something that has contaminated has been contaminated by poop. And of course, for diseases like this, um, it happens where there's poor hygiene, poor public health, and ine inadequate sewage disposal. So some examples of um, cholera or typhoid. And then in the lower urethra, um, something to note is that females have a shorter urethra and our distance um, very, um, between our urethra and our anuses are also um, shorter. So therefore, it makes us more susceptible to um, yeah, like UTIs and stuff like that. And of course, they're like catheters and stuff. Um, yeah, and bacteria can also be transmitted through genitals, so like sexual tr transmission, or from a mother to a kid. So this can happen at the time of birth through vaginal delivery or just transplacental or congenital. So it happens um, during pregnancy. Okay, now we're going to move on to viruses. 
This is all stuff that you guys honestly should know already. I'm just going to like fly through them. So there's acellular, very small, they're non-living, they're obligate intracellular parasites, as in they can't replicate without um, host cells. And they infect all these different types of organisms, but most of them have a limited host range. Yeah, but some can have wide ones, I think. Um, yeah, so the variants themselves can't grow, undergo um, division, and they must like they must need a host cell because they don't have their own um, enzyme enzyme systems. Um, yeah, and then the structures they can be all the way from ten nanometers to four hundred nanometers, um, and they're composed of a genome um, and then a protein capsid that allows them to be in like different shapes, and they also may have an envelope or not. And then, of course, virogenomes can be all these different types. They can be DNA, they can be RNA, um, or they can be like retroviruses, stuff like that. Um, they can be single-stranded or they can be double-stranded. So it's all very complex. And this is just an example of a virus with or without an envelope. Okay, now we're going to move on to the disease processes of viruses. So um, this is like the replication cycle of a virus. And this is stuff you also become really familiar with next time. So there's like viral um, attachment and entry, um, um, coding, replication, assembly of the protein particles, and then release. And then the cycle is repeated. So for a vi um, virus to like cause disease, it must enter into the body. And then there's also like primary replication where it first replicates. And the release of virus, like how it's released in this primary replication determines whether it becomes localized or it becomes systemic. And then, of course, it's our, our body's innate immune response. And viruses usually have an incubation period. And during this time, um, the virus can be contagious or it may not be contagious. It depends on the virus. And then the sec secondary replication in the target tissue, like which part of the body it actually affects. And of course, it's your host immune response to try and get rid of it. And normally they're released or like transmitted to other people. And how it, um, and the outcome it and then there's like different types of resolution in the body, like whether your body gets rid of the infection or if it persists, which we'll look at later. And then of course it's the different types of transmissions again, and it's pretty similar to bacteria. So airborne, fecal oral, direct transfer, blah blah. blah. It's all the same stuff. Okay, so sp spread within the body, the virus can be spread throughout our own bodies through our bloodstreams, our nervous system, or um our lymphatics, and viremia is the presence of like viruses in the blood. It could be primary or secondary, so primary just from the primary replication, and secondary is after there's more replication and it's spreading through the body, and it'll be in higher concentrations. And this can be short or long, and the concentration obviously depends on the rate of the synthesis of these um, virion particles, and it's quite useful for us to diagnose someone. Um, yeah, so we can take like a blood test and see um, what stage of the, I guess you'd say, what stage of the infection they're at. Yeah, and it's also how viruses can be spread to other people. And then there's something called tissue tropism, which really is very low yield. It's not so important at all, but I'm just going to mention it. Like, most viruses preferentially infect and replicate in a certain tissue type, and it's affected by a bunch of different factors. Um, that's list, like further listed in the pre-reading, but it's honestly not important. And yeah, so the eventual outcome of the virus in your body depends on the balance between how we're clearing of it and um, how it's dividing and persisting in your bodies. And this is just a diagram of how a normal viral um, infection occurs. So yeah. Okay, and the effect of these viruses on our bodies. So it can cause all these different things in our bodies. It can cause our cells to break, to lies. Um, it can produce toxic substances. It can cause our cells to transform, which means um, it can cause our cells to become, I guess, like cancerous. Um, it can suppress our immune responses. It can cause us to produce um, products in our bodies that are not normal for us normally. And yeah, or it can cause structural alterations in our cells. And then, of course, these cells have to be shedded to be spread to the next person. And so, yeah, shedding is the release of infections virus um, from the infected host. Um, it could be localized or it could be systemic. And um, shedding of high concentrations, like if you're shedding a lot, obviously it means you're um, more contagious and it can facilitate transmission. Yeah, and so in diseases such as like herpes and stuff, when you have lumps on your skin, like lesions on your skin, it can also be spread um, that way. So yeah, viruses must um, transmit onto other susceptible. Sus 
susceptible host in order to like survive and keep like infecting more people. Yeah, and for persistent infections, some stuff that we should be worried about is that persistent um, infections can be latent and then it can reactivate um, depending on like your circumstances, like your immunity, stuff like that. And then it can cause episodes of the disease, so it can come and go. And it may be associated with virus-induced immunopathological disease, and it can lead to neoplasia, so like cancer. Um, yeah, so recurrent shedding can cause a virus to persist in a population. So you just kind of become a chronic carrier and keep infecting more people slowly. And also a big issue is that um, antivirals or your immune response can't target the virus when it's latent and not re replicating. So it just further allows it to like persist in your body. Yeah, so there are different outcomes of enviral infections. This is quite important, I guess. They're acute, they're chronic, latent, or transforming. So acute is, I guess, this one. Um, it just causes your cells to die, and then it causes you all these bad symptoms, or it could be persistent. Um, yeah, so like chronic, it just keeps staying in your body. Or they could be latent, so they're just hiding your cells, but they're not dividing and stuff. So you don't really show any symptoms, and you can't really target it when, um, with your immune response or with like medicine and stuff like that. And lastly is transforming. So they transform your cell until it's not really a cell anymore, and they divide uncontrollably, uncontrollably. So that's how it becomes like tumor cells. And of course, to control viral infections, this is very um, intuitive. It just through vaccinations, antivirals, or education on how to like prevent it or how to treat it, stuff like that. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to these twelve examples from the active learning session. So last year, I think we were divided into groups, and we all had to research it. And I spent like all day yesterday um, <laughs> researching all of these. So you guys better appreciate me. Just kidding, but yeah. Um, I cannot tell you how important this is. This is all diseases that you have to know eventually, but whether how much detail you have to memorize it right now, I guess it's debatable. Um, but yeah, I'm just gonna go over them. That's good, I guess. Like when someone talks about it, it's all repetition. It helps you remember it. Okay, and yeah, they're divided by um, their root of infection. So first is the respiratory tract, and this is um, Streptococcus pneumoniae. Pneumonia. Ne ah, fuck. I don't know, oops, I just swore. I'm so sorry. Anyway, so they're gram-positive cocci pairs. Look like this, they're pairs. They're part of the normal flora. They can be found in the upper respiratory tract or in the skin as well. And it has these virulence vectors. So they, ha they have a capsule that makes them resistant to phagocytosis. And they also have a pneumolysin, which is a toxin that forms pores in your cells. And apparently it's also alpha hemolyte alpha hemolytic so on a blood agar plate it turns green and it causes major diseases like meningitis or pneumococcal disease and they're transmitted through person to person contact via droplets or auto inoculation so if you're carrying it and you somehow infect yourself and then next is varicella zoster virus so this is the virus responsible for chicken pox and shingles so yeah it's herpes viridae ds dna and it's enveloped so um yeah, you initially get infected with chicken pox like this, and then it estab establishes latency in your dorsal root ganglion, so it affects like nerve cells and stuff, and it'll just hide in there. And one day you, it may reactivate when you have low immunity, and then it causes shingles, which is this. Yeah, so it can be transmit transmitted person to person by direct contact, inhalation of aerosols from the, ew, that's so gross, like aerosols from the fluid of those lesions. Um, yeah. Or like from your respiratory tract secretions, yeah, and it causes like viremia. It can it can be found in the blood. Um, oh God, why did I, why did I agree to do microbiome? I can't pronounce any of these words. Just bear with me, guys. Um, there's Salmonella ty typhi typhi. I don't know. Gram negative bacillus. Um, is normally not found in the normal flora, and it's transmitted through contaminated food, especially like animal meats, and so that's why you have to thoroughly cook them to make sure you kill off all these um, bacteria. And it causes typhoid fever, also known as enteric fever, which is characterized by high fever, prostration, apparently it means like if you're like weak and on the floor, I think, um, abdominal pain, and a rose-colored rash. So they can be chronic carriers that are symptomatic, but they can still become, they're, but they're still infectious because they're, they're still shedding. Yeah. And it's prevented by avoiding fecal contamination of water, food, um, water food supplies with proper hygiene, waste management, water purification, stuff like that. 
and then there's rotavirus. So you should always remember that rotavirus is like the biggest cause of diarrhea um, around the world, especially in kids and infants. It's normally not part of the um, normal flora. It's a Rio Verde DSDNA non-enveloped, and it causes acute systemic infection, leading to isotonic diarrhea. Yes, so I think it kills a lot of children every year, and it's transmitted via fecal oral route through person-to-person contact or by fomite. So of, co- of course, if you're like, um, at like a nursery or, or or whatever, and one kid is infected, and they play with a toy, and then ends up you end up having all the kids infected, and it's actually prevented um, by improved sanitation, of course, which is especially important in really underdeveloped worlds or oral vaccines. So yeah, I think rotavirus is pretty uncommon in more developed countries because we have vaccines and stuff like that. And now we're going to move on to the skin. So there's Staph aureus. You've heard about Staph aureus all the time because they're just they're just so bad, um, I guess. So they're gram-positive cocci, and um, Meredith likes to describe it as um, grape blood clusters. So I guess it does look like that. Um, it is part of the normal flora. It's found in your nose and on your skin. And it's transmitted via direct contact with some with someone infected with contaminated objects or inhaling it. Yeah. And um in the act of learning, um, she wanted us to give four types of different staph infections, so I'll give you some. Um, here they are. Here's some examples. Yep. And it's got a lot of virulence factors. That's why I say it's so bad. It's got all these bad things that help them infect us. And for example, it's got penicillinase. So um penicillin doesn't work on it because it it kill it like deactivates the drug. It's got pro- something called protein A, um, which binds to our um, IgGs, like our antibodies, and prevent opsonization and phagocytosis. And then, of course, there's MRSA. There's the meth- methicillin-resistant staph aureus. Um, so yeah, it's antibiotic-resistant, and it causes all these nosocomial infections in hospital settings, and it leads to all these complications such as pneumonia that are extremely difficult to treat. Yeah. And then there's HPV. So I think a lot of us get um, get vaccinated, or we should be vaccinated against this. And it can cause it's an STI, but it can cause common warts like that. Um, yeah. So it's a papilloma virus. It's small. It has a circular DSDNA. It's non-enveloped, and it's icosahedral. And yeah. So it's transmitted usually via sexual contact um, and vertical transmission. So from a mom t- to a baby. Yeah, so there are many, many types of HPV, and they all kind of infect different body parts. Like, some is more like the skin, and some is more like the genital area. Um, yeah, so the ones that affect the genital area associated with a bunch of cancers, like cervical cancer, and, uh, you know, cancer, vaginal cancer, stuff like that. And of course, it's prevent- as, as, is, as it is an SDI, it can be prevented with condoms and the vaccine, which is Gardasil. Yeah. And yeah, you can see it, like, causing... Um, these warts on the body. Next, um, we're gonna move on to bacteria that, um, no, I mean pathogens that infect the genital urinary tract. So the most common cause of UTIs is E. coli. It's a gram-negative rod. Um, yeah, and so the source is usually from the anus to the urethra. I guess um, I don't know. Like if you're wearing your underwear and it's moving around, I guess it can like smear. Okay, yeah, I'm not gonna go there. Anyway, so. Uh, Oh, uh, crap. Sorry, I forgot to remove that. Anyway, virulence factors. Um, it's got adhesins, so fimbriae that, uh, like, allows it to attach to host cells. It has enterotoxin, hemolysin, and it's got a capsule or H antigen, all these random stuff. Um, yeah, it's the most abundant normal flora micro in the adult female genital urinary tract. Um, and normally we have um, lactobacillus. Normally, vaginas have lactobacillus acidophilus to maintain the pH. And um, antibiotic treatment to against these can cause something called um, like genital thrush, like vaginal thrush, caused by candida albicans. This is all stuff that's going to come like again and again, I think. Which lecture was it? It was a lecture about like, yeah, um, parasites and stuff. And she mentions this all the time. And then next is HIV. You guys probably know a bit about HIV already. It's a retroviridae. It's a positive sense single-stranded RNA retrovirus, and it's enveloped. Um, It's got two glycoproteins on its surface, so GP120, GP41, and these help with um, the virus attaching to host cells and entering them. Yeah, so it's transmitted by sexual intercourse, sharing needles, and vertical transmission. And when it affects a host, it can remain latent in your body um, for up to years, so it just doesn't replicate in your body, yeah, and it causes immunodeficiency, 
um, in the host by targeting their immune cells, so CD4 plus T cells. So it, we it significantly weakens the host immune system, and it allows them to be susceptible to all these diseases that none of us like ever get it um, normally. And now it's transplacental and perinatal. So trans um, an example of transplacental is syphilis. So transplacental just means that um, this disease can be passed from mother to kid while during pregnancy, while perinatal means um, it's passed during delivery and stuff like that. So yeah, um, treponema pallidum, so sorry if it's wrong, it's a gram-negative, spire-shaped, obligate internal parasite. Yeah, it causes syphilis, it's transmitted sexually or from mother to child in utero, and this is known as congenital syphilis. And yeah, so congenital syphilis in kids, it causes facial abnormalities, something called saber shin, so it's when like your legs are wonky and like bendy. You can also call, cause deafness. So torch is like all these things that um, a pregnant mother should be worried about. So yeah, um, I guess it's quite important to know about. So it's like poxoplasmosis, other, which is like syphilis, VZV, HIV, parvovirus, B19, rubella, cytomegalovirus, herpes infection. Yeah. Um, I guess it's important to know this, but it never came up in our exam. So I'm not sure how important it is to memorize all these individual details. Like I just understand that torch exists. Okay, and now it's a herpes simplex virus 2, so HSV, there's 1, there's 2, which is V1 is more like oral herpes, while 2 is like genital herpes, so yeah, um, this virus is herpes viridae, it's linear DSDNA, icosahedral, and enveloped, um, it's transmitted via direct contact with mucosal tissue or secretions from an infected person, so basically it's like an STI. Um, and infects and replicates in nerve cells. So this is similar to, what was it, varicella. Yeah, it can also remain dormant in the dorsal root ganglion until it's reactivated, and it's released by budding because it has an envelope. So instead of, like, because um, some, okay, some viruses are, like, shed um, by bursting the cell, and others are done by, um, do it by budding. And because it's an envelope, it's done through budding. Yeah, and in vertical transmission, it could lead to lasting neurological disability um, or even death of the fetus and newborn. Yep. And now um, I'm going to move on to direct inoculation. So um, the first is like tetanus, Clostridium tetanus. So it's a gram positive anaerobic ro uh, rod, and it, when it develops a spore, it looks like drumstick like, I guess, like that. I don't know. Does that look like a drumstick? Uh, I don't know. And apparently, the bacteria itself is very sensitive to heat and is anaerobic, but its spores are resistant to heat and a lot of our usual antiseptics to get rid of them. And it causes tetanus, so um, I guess this picture is supposed to represent that. So it's like, for example, if you like step on a rusted nail or whatever, um, yeah, it causes this. So it's like you have unopposed... Oh my god, stop! I'm so sorry. Is it going to come back? Okay. Um, it causes unopposed muscle contraction and spasm as these toxins interfere with your nervous system and it prevents the release of neurotransmitters. And it's got um, some uh, two virulence factors, which are two exotoxins. They're called tetanolysin and tetanospasmin. And the second one is responsible for neurotox these neurotoxins that like allows it to all do all this bad stuff. Yeah, and they're transmitted via contaminated wounds. Um, the wounds can be both minor and major. And I was just reading about it yesterday, saying that oftentimes it actually shows up in people with minor wounds because when, when it's minor, you don't really think of, like, um, I don't know, disinfecting it or getting a vaccine for it. But, yeah, it's prevented by different vaccines, and one of them is DTAP. So I think this is, like, um, a vaccine that's a mixture um, of, like, um, uh, what's the word? Like, it's a vaccine for, like, three different diseases or something like that. Um, like diphtheria, um, tetanus, and I can't remember what the P stands for. And then they, there's HBV, um, hepatina viridae. It's more circular, partially double-stranded DNA, non-enveloped. It's transmitted parenterally, um, sexually, so it's an STI as well, or through intravenous drug use. Yeah, so chronic infection can be asymptomatic, but it can lead to first chronic hepatitis and then cirrhosis, so whereas, whereas like... Um, like a lot of scar tissue develops and eventually leads to cancer, so hepatocellular carcinoma. Yeah, um, and it can be prevented with the Hep B vaccine. So yeah, these are the different modes of transmission. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay, I'm done. Thank you so much.
see you guys next week. Okay, parasitic infections. We'll try to keep it short. We'll be running through what the different types of parasite is. What is a parasite? Have a look at a life cycle or two and talk quickly about their global and clinical significance. So basically, the only things you guys will need to know. So parasitism. So remember, parasitism occurs when there's a relationship between two organisms where one benefits and the other is harmed. So the parasite benefits and this is at the expense of the host. The thing with parasites is that they can also vary in size. So they're not just, you know, small like many bacteria and viruses. They can be unicellular um, and even multicellular organisms like worms. Parasites have evolved alongside the human immune system, so their pathophysiology is also adapted. Parasitic diseases are also more commonly found in developing countries. There's a couple types of parasites, so helminths, protozoa, um, an example being malaria. You've also got ectoparasites or arthropods, so they don't cause, but they transmit disease, as well as kinetoplastids, so parasites with flagella, and a complexa, parasites which have special organelles which help them invade human cells. The main ones I want you guys to listen or worry about is helminths and protozoa. When we talk about helminths, we're talking about those really big multicellular eukaryotic organisms. So we're talking about worms here, um, hookworm and roundworm, flatworm, all, all the worms essentially. There's two main methods of transmission. There's direct penetration of skin. And so that's, for example, hookworm, it penetrates through the skin of your foot most often. And there's also fecal oral transmission. So via the ingestion of contaminated foods or whatnot, where you ingest larvae, and egg. So that's the um, method of transmission for enterobius. And then with helm infestations is that it often requires repeated infection. So it's not just once, normally it needs several times. Helminths can target all different organs. And here's a couple examples. So you've got nematodes, which are roundworms, putty helminths, um, flatworms, cestodes, which are tapeworms. So you've got your tinea, you've got pork and beef tapeworm, and you've also got trematodes being flukes. I don't think you guys need to know a lot more on that, to be honest. But um, the clinical, signif clinical significant um, parts of helminth infestation is that um, hookworm infestation can lead to anemia because hookworms live in the bowel, they live among the mucus, and they suck blood from the bowel, just small amounts over a period of time, and that can cause anemia. And there's also filariasis that's caused by nematodes, so a roundworm. It's transmitted by mosquitoes and it requires a midnight smear. Now, filariasis, it's kind of gross. What it does is um, at night, it comes out through the anus and lays eggs. So that's why you need a midnight smear. Sometimes they call it a cello tape test. And, you know, it causes itchiness and whatnot. And so it's often spread via the fingers um, after scratching. So again, it's a pretty nasty one. <laughs> Next, we've got protozoa. So these are your unicellular eukaryotes. Giardia, Trichomonas, Toxo, mal um, Malaria. You've got, you've got a, quite a couple of them. So starting off with Giardia, it affects the GIT. Um, it's a waterborne disease. So when I say it affects the GIT, it's giving you symptoms like severe diarrhea, malabsorption, abdominal pain. And that's what Giardia looks like underneath the microscope. Um, there's like photos of like smiling Giardia with like the holes in the smile. But yeah, that's how you kind of remember. Giardia lives in the intestines and it feeds on the intestinal walls. In terms of treatment, you just give patients metronidazole. Um, trichomonas, so this one's urogenital. Um, more often, it's an STI and more often affects women. Um, it occurs in the cervix tissues. You can find them in a pap smear. And again, you treat them with metronidazole and this is what it looks like. Um, a bit like a squid, I like to think, with flagella. <laughs> Next. Toxo. So when you think toxo, remember cats. Think about cats. <laughs> it affects your CNS and your lymph nodes and it travels within the lymph. Um, you get infected by often ingesting cat feces, often in kitten, kittens, so young cats, um, or you know, ingestion of undercooked meat and contaminated water. Now in most people, it is asymptomatic, so it's harmless, but it does infect those who are immunocompromised and it is quite significant um, and it can cause quite severe damage to a fetus if a mother gets infected with toxo. Okay, and last of all, pretty famous protozoan, um, malaria. So this one affects the blood and the CNS. And we're about to talk just a little bit more detail about malaria. Around the world, there's five species of malaria. The only one you need to know really, it's the most common one, 
is Plasmodium falciparum. Malaria is a tropical disease and half of the world lives in population. Um, half of the world's population lives in areas at risk. It's transmitted by the female Anopheles mosquito bite and um, has a pretty complex life cycle. So these are the steps in the life cycle. Um, I'll run through them and then I'll show you the diagram and kind of run through them again. So you've got sporozoids. Um, when a mosquito bites, it injects sporozoids. They enter the blood and infect the liver. There they undergo replication um, as merozoids via the liver and that's called the liver cycle. Then they infect red blood cells and become trophozoids and eventually schizonts, which rupture and spreads more merozoids. So they spread themselves within the blood. They can also develop into gametocytes and join with oocytes when a mosquito bites the human again. And that will form oocysts and more sporozoids are formed and the cycle recommences. Now, a lot of these words are a bit weird, a bit difficult to follow, so that I do have an image for it. Okay, so starting again. Um, when the mosquito injects you for the first time, it injects sporozoids, yeah? Those will go into the liver and they'll undergo mitotic replication within the liver. So they'll form many copies of themselves and um, these are merozoids. These enter the blood cycle, so they'll go through and form um, schizonts and they'll yeah, trophozoids and schizonts, and they'll keep um, increasing in numbers in the blood. And so that will be parasitemia. Emia, presence in blood, so parasite. We're increasing the um, presence in blood via the mirazoid schizont cycle. And also, you can form gametocytes within the body. When a mosquito bites you again, um, you'll be able to see the gametocyte combined with the oocysts, and then you can form so oocysts, and then you form new sporozoids and the cycle starts again. So just know, injection with sporozoids, you've got the liver cycle and it increases um, parasitemia, so amount of parasite in the blood, and then you can also get schizons and stuff from that cycle here, and starts the process starts again with the gametocyte and the oocyst. <laughs> Hopefully that's not too confusing, but I don't remember being assessed too much on this, so I wouldn't stress too much about it. What I can say is that malaria does cause rosetting, that's one of the key words, and that occurs when uninfected cells cluster around infected ones, it makes a problem worse, and this can cause obstruction of capillaries. In terms of malaria um, diagnosis, you have thick film and thin film tests. Thick film will identify the presence of malaria. Thin film will identify the species of malaria. Um, the treatment includes a combination of drugs. In terms of prevention, there's no available vaccines. So use mosquito nets and insect repellent. Um, for a lot of people who are traveling to areas where malaria is common, they will take doxycycline, so one of the antibiotics as prophylaxis. They'll take it for about 45 days to um, protect themselves. And yeah, really key in practice, fever in a return traveler is malaria unless proven otherwise. So just be careful about that. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about though is ectoparasites. So this one's a little bit easier to follow than the, mos the mosquito and malaria one. Ectoparasites, they don't cause the disease, but they transmit the disease. So you've got things like scabies, which is an infestation. They'll cause rashes like this and breaks in skin, and that can cause secondary infection. It's really quite itchy and uncomfortable. For lice, um, yeah, head, body, pubic lice. So head lice are nits, body lice could be like typhus, and pubic lice are called crabs, causes itchiness. And then you've also got ticks. Not too much of a concern, but they can cause tick paralysis. And the last one is myasis, which is fly larvae. I mean, it can burrow into people's wounds and eat flesh. So most of these, so mice, I think, occurs mainly when there's poor sanitation and hygiene practices. But yeah, that brings an end to parasites. Okay, so I'm going to start off by talking about wound healing and more specifically about hemostasis and coagulation. So hemostasis is just what we call the process of blood clotting in response to injury. So hemostasis is um, it's a complex physiological process involving cells, so your platelets and fibroblasts. Um, it involves soluble proteins, so coagulation factors and inhibitors, and as well as um, insoluble proteins, so extracellular matrix proteins. So hemostasis is usually activated by injury to the blood cells, uh, blood vessels, sorry. And the hemostatic system is what seals off the injury. Um, and it seals off the injury by using a platelet plug and um, through fibrin clot formation. 
And um, this is what stops hemorrhage. Um, so three major steps to hemostasis. First, you'll have vasoconstriction due to the smooth muscles. And then you'll have um, the platelet plug, which provides a temporary blockage of the break. And then finally, you will form a more stable fibrin clot. And when the injured endo endothelium is healed, the clot will dissolve via a process called fibrinolysis. Um, and this is what will eventually restore blood flow. So um, platelets, which is um, what we can also call thrombocytes. So they're produced in bone marrow and they are small discoid particles that are released from megakaryocytes. And the production is regulated by thrombopoietin, which is produced by liver and kidneys. So um, going back to this um, kind of diagram from immunology, you can see that over here, this is where your thrombocytes come from or your platelets come from. So they kind of, these little buds that are off, that are coming off of your megakaryocytes um, basically are what give rise to platelets. And you can see the same thing here. So uh, I mentioned the primary platelet plug before. So um, the first step is that you'll have your damaged endothelium um, and it will be, um, when your endothelium is damaged, it exposes the extracellular matrix here. Um, and the extracellular matrix is what contains thrombogenic factors. So these are factors that promote clot formation, okay? So step two, um, your platelets will roll along the endothelium and they will adhere to the exposed extracellular matrix. So here you can see that they're rolling along the endothelium and adhering. Um, and then the platelets are activated. Um, they'll undergo like a shape change um, and they'll look kind of spiky, which is why when you Google um, platelets, you'll often see um, them looking more spiky than discoid. They're still platelets. It's just um, this is the shape change to show that they've been activated. Once they've been activated, they'll recruit and activate more platelets. And then the activated platelets will um, cross-link um, and form fibrinogen bridges, which is what we also call mesh. Uh, and then that's what forms your primary platelet plug. You can see here, um, it's kind of blocking the site of injury. From there, um, the formation of the platelet plug activates what we call secondary hemostasis. So secondary hemostasis is all about um, creating a more stable um, blood clot. So um, in your blood, you'll have circulating proteins that are responsible for coagulation, and they will respond to the exposed platelet membrane phospholipid. Um, and then coagulation is achieved by sequential activation of a series of circulating precursor proteins, um, what we call coagulation factors. The coagulation cascade results in the formation of fibrin, which enmeshes the platelet plug again to create a firm, stable hemostatic plug or a blood clot. And there are different coagulation cascade pathways um, use, utilizing different coagulation factors depending on the type of trauma, so whether it's internal trauma or external trauma. And this um, diagram here is just a simplified diagram um, showing the different types of uh, coagulation cascade pathways. So you can have the intrinsic pathway, um, the extrinsic pathway, and they'll go through um, a set of changes um, and it will lead into the common pathway. Um, oh, that's a typo there, but it should say coagulation factors. Um, so your coagula coagulation factors are either enzymes or cofactors. And in secondary hemostasis, they're activated in a series of steps. Um, and they're just numbered in an order, in their order of discovery. Um, almost all coagulation factors are synthesized in the liver. Um, and this is just a little um, fact that will become a bit more relevant later on. So vitamin K is required for the synthesis of factors 2, 7, 9, and 10. Um, and it also reverses the effects of warfarin. So an easy way to remember this is to just remember your um, Australian TV channel. So channel two is ABC, channel seven, channel nine, channel 10. Um, so it seems like a lot. Um, you definitely don't need to remember um, like this whole table. Um, it's just um, giving you context for explaining the coagulation cascade pathway. 
So coagulation cascade pathways, um, you saw this image before. Um, so your intrinsic pathway, the blue, um, what we also call the contact activation pathway, it's activated by damage within the blood vessel. Um, and it can also be activated by uh, plaques as well. So um, I think at first glance, it seems very um, complicated, but basically all you need to know that the intrinsic pathway, um, it, uh, again, so it's just activated by damage inside the blood cell. Um, you'll have, um, so 12A means that it's factor 12 that's been activated, okay? So I talked about precursors before. So um, just remember that um, it's, not, it's not going straight away to 12A, okay? So first you're going to have some kind of um, trauma that turns factor 12 into factor 12A. And then from there, factor 12A can activate factor 11, which turns into factor 11A, okay? So it's activated. Uh, and then again, 9A, so um, 9, factor 9 will become um, the activated form. And then it will work together with the activated form of factor 8, so 8A. And then it will enter the common pathway, which is um, what we see here. The, ex the extrinsic pathway or the tissue factor pathway is activated by damage to the tissue. And it also uses factor 3. So um, similar kind of idea here, you have tissue damage. Um, then you will get the, activate, uh, the activation of factor seven into seven A. It will work with tissue factor, which is basically factor three, and then it will enter the common pathway. So we just call it the common pathway because it's um, this exact same pathway is, uh, is shared between both the intrinsic and extrinsic pathway. So in the common pathway, um, you have 10 A, um, and then um, converted into, 2A and then 1A. So here you get thrombin, um, which converts fibrinogen, which is the inactivated form of fibrin. Okay, so thrombin converts fibrinogen into fibrin, which is a stable version. And then at this stage, the fibrin stage is where your mesh occurs to create a stable clot. Okay, so a bit more about the formation of a stable clot. So fibrinogen, which is factor one, okay, and remember fibrin is what we call factor 1A. So fibrinogen factor one, um, it's a large glycoprotein circulating in the blood. It's comprised of two pairs of three polypeptide chains. So um, your alpha polypeptide, um, and you've got, oh, you've got two alpha and then two beta, the green, and then two gamma, um, which is the red. And it forms what we call a dimer, right? Because um, it's uh, two pairs of the same chains. Okay, so the first step of the formation of a stable clot. So first you will have thrombin, which is um, 2A. Uh, it will cleave fibrinogen, which is factor one, to give a soluble fibrin monomer, which is factor 1A. The next step um, then is that your fibrin polymer is formed by binding between chains, creating an insoluble fibrin network. So you have your fibrin monomer after fibrinogen is cleaved, um, and then it will form um, a network of fibrin, um, and in which case it will, be, it will then become insoluble. And then the next step, um, thrombin will also activate factor eight, which um, becomes 8A for activate, activated. Um, and then factor 8A is what will create crosslinks between the chains as well. So then it's essentially just creating a whole network that um, stabilizes into a solid clot. So um, once the clot has kind of done its work to stop um, any possible hemorrhaging, um, we have to have a mechanism of removing the clot. And this is what we call fibrinolysis. So fibrinolysis is, the, is just the mechanism of clot removal or prevention of clot enlarging. Um, similar to clot formation, it's controlled by a series of cofactors, inhibitors, and receptors. Uh, fibrinolysis commences once the damaged region is completely repaired, and um, an enzyme, which is what we, uh, which is plasmin, is activated to dissolve the clot. And then um, plasmin is created on the surface of the fibrin clot. So you can see here, plasminogen, it activates to become plasmin. Plasmin works on fibrin, which is, um, remember fibrin is what 
our clot is made of, it breaks down fibrin to dissolve the clot and then you get different fragments. Um, and you see here D-dimer, that will become important later on. So D-dimers are present on fibrin monomers. So they're your beta and gamma polypeptide parts. So you see here. So when plasmin breaks the fibrin clot down, it kind of um, releases your D-dimers into your bloodstream. Therefore, we test for D-dimers to see if there has been clot formation and breaking down in the body because the D-dimers wouldn't be present in the um, blood without clot formation in the first place. Um, and it only occurs once a clot has been degraded. So that's why we test for D-dimers to um, kind of see if fibrinolysis is um, functioning normally. Um, so there's a whole other range of tests for hemostatic function. Um, so you kind of have your like more general full blood exam, which looks at platelets. Um, and then you have your more specified coagulation screening, screening tests. So um, prothrombin time, PT, activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT, thrombin time, TT, D-dimers, fibrinogen levels, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so this is just the, so prothrombin, prothrombin time. Um, and um, all the other coagulation screening tests, you have the typical reference range here. So this is, if it's within this range, then obviously it's normal. Um, detected abnormalities means that um, what is the specific screening test actually looking at? So for example, um, PT will be looking at um, factors eight, uh, 10, five and two in fibrinogen. Um, and it's basically just looking at, um, um, Okay, so basically how this relates is that it looks at different pathways. So APTT will look at, um, sorry, APPT, um, no, sorry, APTT looks at your um, e intrinsic pathway, um, whereas PT will look at your extrinsic pathway. And then TT kind of just looks at your common pathway. So it's not as um, good as ordering um, PT or APTT, uh, APTT tests. Um, and so anyways, um, the way that these detected abnormalities relate is you can see here PT tests for um, factors 10 and 8, which is what is relevant here in your extrinsic pathway. And it'll be the same for APTT. Um, yeah, so just try and uh, remember which test uh, looks at which cascade pathway. So why would you want to um, order hemostatic tests? Um, there's a number of reasons, but commonly um, you can order hemostatic tests if you want to find out if patients um, with acute bleeding or acute clots have a either a bleeding or clotting disorder. So for example, hemophilia, which is where the blood can't clot properly due to a lack of clotting factors. Um, and also to monitor the patient response to taking anticoagulant drugs, such as warfarin or heparin, um, and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so going back, um, I mentioned that you can look at um, the more general full blood exam, and more specifically platelet numbers. Um, so full blood exams are just common tests that provide information about the number of um, your red, white, uh, red and white blood cells and the platelets in the body. And um, platelet counts are very common for hemostasis tests as, um, as obviously platelets are important in um, hemostasis. And also um, prothrombin time, so PT, this is the time in seconds for a fibrin clot to form. It measures the function of the extrinsic and common pathway. Um, so here, um, and again, um, just reiterating that it uh, looks at factors two, five, seven, and 10. Um, similarly, your activated partial thromboplastin time, APTT, will also look at the time in seconds for a fibrin clot to form. So um, here, um, this is your typical ranges for both of those tests, okay? Um, so your APTT measures the function of the intrinsic and common pathway, and it looks at all, the, all of these factors. So remember when I was talking about vitamin K before? Um, so for example, if a patient has a prolonged PT time, so a prolonged prothrombin time, um, either with or without as well a prolonged APTT, then you can give the patient vitamin K to determine if there is a vitamin K deficiency. Because um, remember, um, vitamin K is um, required for the synthesis of factors two, seven, nine, and 10, right? So um, 
if PT and APTT kind of look at the, all these factors, then um, you can just um, see if they're vitamin K deficient using these tests. And if vitamin K doesn't um, fix these um, tests, then you have to think of other um, problems. So hemostatic disorders, um, so purpura, which is um, large purple patches, more than three, millimeter, uh, three millimeters in diameter. It's usually a problem in the coagulation cascade pathway. Um, and here, this is an image of what purpura looks like. Petechiae is um, smaller red dots and it's less than three millimeters in diameter. Um, and this indicates um, usually abnormal, uh, abnormalities in platelets. You can also have um, mucosal bleeding, uh, joint bleeding, muscle hematomas, and bleeding after surgery. So um, this is just a table for the causes of hemostatic disorders. You can study this in your own time as well. Um, and thrombosis. So a thrombus is just a solid mass. So it's either, it can either be a plug or a clot that's formed in the circulation from blood components. Um, and its basic structure is comprised of platelets and fibrin. It can occur in both veins and arteries. So for example, DVT, deep vein thrombosis. Um, so when you have a thrombus, it results in the restriction or blockage of the blood vessel. And um, a fragment of the thrombus can also break off and travel in the bloodstream and create blockages at other sites. So when a fragment of a thrombus breaks off, that's what we call an embolus, okay? So thrombus is not the same as an embolus. You just need to remember that a thrombus is the um, kind of like the, uh, the main mass, I guess, and then the embolus is the fragment that breaks off from it. Um, and depending on what organ is affected by the blood clot, you will have um, specific clinical signs related to it as well. Um, and then your causes of thrombosis. So there's three factors that are important to thrombus formation. And this is what we usually call um, virtuose triad. So these are the three factors. So endothelial injury. Um, so uh, is there a disruption in the endothelium? Um, for example, either due to atherosclerotic plaques or toxins. Um, the second factor is, is there abnormal blood flow? Um, this can be due to blood turbulence or blood stasis. And then finally, um, is there abnormal coagulation? So um, if a patient has all three of these factors, which were, um, again, what we call virtuose triad, then we, uh, we probably want to think immediately that they're much more susceptible to um, thrombosis. Um, and that's it for hemostasis and coagulation. Okay, hi. Um, so our last topic is how tissues respond to injury. Um, as you can see, everything that we really need to cover is right in this mind map right here. I think it's going to be provided in your lectures. Um, and I'll be using this as a blueprint to kind of structure this section. It's not a big section um, because most of it is very intuitive and you can kind of um, you can kind of, it's, it's very commonsensical, I feel. Um, and once you know this stuff, you'll get the hang of it. So before um, I go on for too long, let's just get started. Um, so basic principles would be that, uh, basic principles of how um, tissues respond to injury is that um, cells are always adapting and changing according to environmental stimulus. Okay, so cells, aren't, cells won't just stay um, the same, they will respond to things. If, let's say, there's a lot of strain on your heart, your heart tissues are going to, um, to start multiplying and you're going to get an enlarged heart. If your liver is damaged, is damaged or um, it's also kind of being functionally strained by alcohol and that, that sort of thing, it's also going to um, expand and maybe even fibrose because it's just receiving that level of, st of stress. So um, in that respect, cells are always changing and adapting according to the environmental stimulus. Um, cells are also, um, sorry, cells under constant stress will adapt from one cell type to the other. That's exactly kind of what I said in the previous, in the previous bullet point, um, which is that if, um, yeah, your cells are just highly responsive to environmental stimulus, and if they're under stress, they will adapt from one, from one cell type to another. Um, and injury to cells, um, injury to cells can be reversible or irreversible, um, common sense again. So reversible injuries will heal and the cell will revert back to normal 
while irreversible injuries will not heal and the cells will die via necrosis or apoptosis. Um, so yeah, that's basically um, all that you need to know as like foundational knowledge for this chapter. Um, so why do cells get injured? Um, there are a good number of reasons why cells can get injured. The first and the main, the, the one you're going to encounter the most as in your time in like clinical practice is oxygen deprivation. So this is what causes the intense pain in ischemic heart conditions. Okay, so um, you guys are going to learn about um, myocardial infarctions in um, your second semester. You're going to learn that um, when your heart, uh, when, when the blood vessels that supply blood to your heart um, have been blocked, have been occluded, um, oxygen doesn't get to the tissue in your heart, in your heart, like cardiac muscle tissue. Um, and this causes, uh, this, is ca this causes injury to your cardiac muscle tissue. This causes your um, cardiac muscle tissue to sort of die off or get inflamed. And this kind of um, irritates the nerves around the heart. And this is what causes the intense pain in, um, when you have a heart attack. Um, quite apart from also causing the life-threatening nature of a heart attack. So yeah, um, oxygen deprivation, that's a, big, um, that's a big thing you should look out for um, in cell cellular injury. So there's chemical agents also. You just kind of think back to, you know, if you uh, dunk, if, oh, dunk is a bit dark. If you get splashed by acid, um, I really hope that doesn't happen to anyone here, but um, if you get splashed by acid, you are injuring your skin cells, possibly even injuring the cells underneath your skin. Um, and yeah, that causes cellular injury. Um, can also be from it can also be from environmental toxins, um, carbon monoxide, that sort of thing. Um, there's also infectious agents. I'm sure that in the previous topic, um, the other people in our team have touched on a ton of ways in which um, bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi can actually injure the cell, cause damage to our human bodies. So I won't go too deep into that, but just remember that we have learned that before. Um, there's also immunological reactions. Um, if you think about multiple sclerosis, arthritis, sorry, rheumatological arthritis, rheumatoid, <laughs> rheumatoid arthritis, sorry, um, brain is not working. Um, and various other in autoimmune conditions that can cause damage to cellular injury. Um, genetic factors also can cause um, cellular injury. Uh, nutritional imbalances, metabolic dis metabolic metabolic dysfunctions, that sort of thing can also cause injury to cells. Um, physical agents, you know, um, mechanical damage such as in like lacerations, injuries, um, and also um, just aging in general. You would have heard from Craig Cassid that um, as we get older, our cells have like shortened telomeres, they die off, that sort of thing. So yeah, those, these are the multiple ways that our cells can face injury. Um, mm, okay, uh, and on our next slide, we have, sorry about that. Okay, so physical signs of cellu cellular injury. How do you know when cells have been injured? Um, so this again, um, this is very important to your practice in, sorry, this is very important again to your practice as um, clinicians. You need to look out for redness. So redness means that there's a dilation of underlying blood vessels at the site of injury. Okay, um, I should preface this by saying um, that the physical signs of cell cellular injury um, are visible because your body has already started um, trying to respond to the injury. They're not signs that... Um, they're not signs of an injury. They're signs that a cell, the cell is, res your body is responding to the injury. Because sometimes injuries can be like invisible or um, you probably can't detect them um, so easily. So remember that this is all based on your, your body's response. Okay, so redness again, um, dilation of underlying blood vessels at the site of injury. And why does this happen? This happens because uh, when you get injured, let's say if it's at, because of an infectious agent, like a flesh eating bacteria, um, what, do you, what does your body wanna do? Your body wants to send antibodies um, over to the site of the infection and really um, help to um, help, sorry, the immune system will, um, will send multiple chemokines, cytokines, um, leukocytes to help fight the infection and um, heal, um, not really heal, but yeah, heal the, in, heal the injury quite aside from also getting rid of the, um, the noxious agent. So redness is really because 
that's the body really fast tracking um, all of the uh, all of the the fighting you know the fighting thingies um, to the site of injury okay sorry I'm not very articulate today I'm quite tired um, okay so swelling again why is there swelling? Well, may, it could be also because um, of the dilation of blood vessels. It could also be because, um, you know, if let's say your tissues get damaged, um, ex your intracellular fluid could leak out and cause a bit of edema, that sort of thing. So swelling, okay, maybe not that closely related to um, the body's kind of fight against um, pathogens, but still it's related. So heat, Heat um, is due to increased blood flow, which trans transports inflammatory mediators to the site of injury. I'm not sure if you guys have learned this um, previously in like high school biology or something like that, but a lot of the, a lot of the, oh no, wait, I touched on this last week. Yeah, yeah. Um, but basically temp temperature regulation in your body is done um, through vasodilation and vasoconstriction. That, and that's because your, your blood actually, um, it kind of retains a lot of heat. So again, if you are, um, if you are uh, in a cold environment, your uh, blood vessels are going to shrink up, uh, basically constrict, because they don't want all of this heat that's in your blood to escape to the outside world. So what happens when um, we, have a, we have some infection or injury, your body wants to try and fight um, whatever's irritating the cells there, um, and therefore the, uh, the blood vessels dilate. So what happens when this dilation happens? The, the blood that is containing, um, like kind of holding all of your heat inside it, um, the blood will, um, there will be an increased flow of blood to that site. Um, and this, this increased flow of blood to that site will also be carrying all of the, like heat in your, um, all of the heat. And this is going to, this is going to cause, um, yeah, this is going to cause, cause heat at the site of injury. I'm sorry. That was that was really bad in like a physics kind of point of view, which I am not a physics person. So just know that blood like carries heat. Um, so loss of function. Again, pain or swelling uh, may prevent movement of the injured region. So um, why do we have pain? Pain would pain um, as we're going to discuss in the next section right um, right down here. Pain is the distortion is caused by the distortion of tissues by swelling and can also be the side effect of the accumulation of inflammatory mediators. So, um, so before, I, before I kind of um, link this back to loss of function, so pain, um, pain can be caused by dis distortion of tissues that swell up. Um, that can be the reason why you have pain in um, nerve, in like um, compartment syndromes. It's because all of your muscles, they kind of surround, in your leg especially, they're, they're in like compartments that are surrounded by um, layers of uh, thick membranes. So when um, injury happens to one of the muscles inside this compartment, um, you know that because your body wants to fight off, um, prevent infection, respond to the injury, um, send clotting factors to that site, um, there is going to be a lot of swelling there, and that swelling is actually going to cause the the um, volume, the total volume of you know the muscles inside that compartment to kind of swell up, ex um, increase in volume, um, and that's going to push on the muscle, oh, sorry, on the nerves that that um, that supply that muscle, and that is why um, you are going to have quite a bit of pain in that section. So that's um, so that explanation really goes more for like um, mechanical injuries. Um, it can it can also be applied to things like as I said earlier my, myocardial infarction and also um, and also when you have um, pulmonary uh, pulmonary emboli or like uh, infections in your lungs or damage to your lung tissue it can cause swelling in the lung tissue that pushes um, on the nerves that supply the body wall the wall of your like the wall of your chest and that you know, when you push on a nerve, obviously that's not going to feel very good. So that's how uh, pain happens from like a mechanical point of view. But from an inflammatory, um, more like cellular chemical point of view, um, we have prostaglandins in our, we have prostaglandins. These are inflammatory markers. And this is, um, pro prostaglandins are really what um, kind of mediate pain sensation. Again, this will all be touched on in semester two. I am literally giving you guys so much semester two information, but I feel like, um, but I feel like when I'm looking back on this stuff now, as somebody who has already gone through semester two and a bit of you know year two also, um, I'm kind of, 
I, I kind of appreciate the link a bit more. So I'm really hoping that you guys um, at least will um, enjoy this kind of big picture view of what you guys are learning now, how it's important to your practice as um, clinicians. So yeah, um, prostaglandins, these are, um, prostaglandins are inflammatory mediators. And they're really what, um, and if let's say you are having um, pain medications, um, and said, you know, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, um, anti-inflammatory something, sorry. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, so if you have NSAIDs or even if you take corticosteroids, they, what they're doing is they're fighting your inflammatory markers, which, are, which actually um, contribute to the sensation of pain, okay? So how does that contribute to loss of function? So pain and severe swelling may prevent movement of the injured region. You just kind of think about it. Um, if let's say, if you've ever gotten the feeling of having like an insect bite in the middle, in, in like your elbow there, right? Um, and then like it swells up and then every time you try and move your elbow, it's like really, I, I don't know, I just really don't like the feeling. It's really weird. So I would ration it out as, you know, um, pain and severe swelling is going to stop you from wanting to um, move a certain area. So that was really long-winded, um, but I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, okay, and um, factors affecting the cell's response. So how are cells going to respond? Um, sorry. So what affects how cells are going to respond to um, all the injuries that I've listed above? So this, um, this response is going to depend on how much tissue, or the amount of damage done. So how much tissue has been damaged, um, how big a chunk has been like taken out of your has been like taken out of your leg by a wild bear, or if it's just kind of like a little abrasion, um, and the type of tissue, the type of tissue that has been injured. So if it's um, if it's oh, fun fact that I really literally just learned like two nights ago um, from my friend in year five, um, is that nerves actually um, a lot of nerves can't be repaired so in surgery if you get like stabbed you can stitch together your blood vessels you can stitch together your tissues and like your soft tissues and your skin and all that but you can't kind you can't really stitch together your nerves um, I guess because nobody wants to put a needle through a nerve right that seems kind of crazy but um, usually your nerves will kind of rip join together on their own um, but you really kind of just kind of just leave your nerves inside um, the body kind of like all stringy, like, which I, I just thought it was really funny. So, um, yeah, so, so the cell's response really just de um, depends on how capable of regeneration this tissue type is. Um, and the, lastly, the duration. So how persistent was this injury? Have you been sustaining damage to the same um, area for a long time? Is this like a flesh eating bacteria where it's just been gnawing at the same spot for a long time and it's just not being able to heal? Or is this kind of just, you know, a cut that you got on your arm yesterday and you just kind of slap a bandage on it or just put in a little bit of a uh, few stitches? Um, and yeah, so here as we see, this is an example of an injury that's probably not going to heal anytime soon. So this really determines the response of the um, cell the response of the cell to the injury. So um, on different tissue types. So different tissues have different um, regenerative properties. So we have the first we have labile tissue. Um, labile is a really gross word, I feel so. Ugh. But anyway, labile tissue um, continuously pr um, proliferates um, and they're just continuously replacing each other. So the one that I guess immediately comes to mind is your skin. So your squamous epithelium of the mouth, skin, or even your vaginal canal. Um, these are cells that are constantly under like shearing force and they're, they're therefore cells that continuously have to be replaced. There's also the col um, columnar epithelium of the intestinal tract and the urinary tract. Um, and there's also bone marrow cells. So these are all cells that are continuously replicating. So stable cells, on the other hand, these cells kind of don't really um, replicate a lot, but they are qu still quite responsive to injury. So we have liver cells and your alveoli in your lungs. Um, and then lastly, we have, um, we have permanent cells. So cells that normally don't replicate. So these are neurons, skeletal muscle, and cardiac muscle. That's why um, if you have 
a myocardial infarction or if somebody has a myocardial infarction, it's really hard to recover from that because there is um, already damage that has been done to your heart muscle. And therefore, you know, from then on, you kind of have to treat your heart muscle like it's made of glass because essentially it's already been damaged and it's, um, it's so, it's almost impossible to recover um, entirely from that. So, okay. So what happens if um, cells cannot heal, if this, if this injury is irreversible and very severe? So cells are going to die off either naturally or, ah, uh, sorry, what just happened? Okay, so cells are going to die, they're going to die off, they're going to die off, okay, they're going to die off either naturally or unnaturally. So um, the natural way that this happens is apoptosis. So apoptosis. Um, is a normal physiological process that gets rid of dysfunctional cells. Um, while while necrosis, um, necrosis is passive, accidental, and it's pr um, premature with un uncontrolled release of inflammatory cellular content. So um, these, um, yeah, so essentially these are both cell death, but one is natural, one is regulated, one is, you know, very intentional. Um, as a way to replace cells that have been have sustained like natural damage, uh, whereas necrosis happens when there is a really serious um, and unnatural injury. Um, okay, so what happens in apoptosis? Well, um, there is going to be a picture on the next slide that's going to explain this way more than I can. Um, but basically, for apoptosis, you have your plasma you have your plasma membrane. Um, it kind of invaginates, so it it kind of parts of it kind of shrink in, so it's got a kind of like wavy appearance. And this forms what we call, um, what we call blebs, a really fun word to say, my favorite word in the entirety of this, um, of year one, blebs. So cells, so this is when cells break out into different chunks. Um, they contain, um, or these blebs are basically tiny mem membrane bound, um, kind of uh, like mini cells that still contain um, their organelles, they still contain contract, um, kind of condensed DNA. Um, and they're, they're basically, they're basically um, these tiny little apoptotic bodies. So these apoptotic bodies are phagocytosed by macrophages. So they're gotten rid of in a very, very natural kind of way. Um, and there's basically no inflammation. There's no fuss about it. It kind of just shrinks up into these little wavy structures and then goes poof into into tiny blobs and then it's consumed by macrophages and then that's it. So there's there's really no um, there's really no fuss about that. Whereas for necrosis, um, basically the in invagination of um, plasma membrane uh, of the plasma membrane takes place and this also forms blebs. But because this is um, this is not regulated, these blebs kind of um, rather than rather than kind of breaking up, they kind of fuse and the cell kind of swells um sorry yeah the cells the cell swells um the plasma membrane eventually ruptures releases cellular content into the surroundings and this triggers an inflammatory response which um as you can guess is not good so as you can see here we we have the difference between apoptosis and necrosis um so yeah so one of them has um inflammation the other one um is just naturally taken up by the body itself. And lastly, um, if let's say the cell hasn't been, you know, it, if let's say the cell hasn't been exactly injured severely or, um, you know, damaged in such a horrible way, but if it's just under constant stress, um, these cells are likely to adapt. So um, there's another thing that we learn in year two, it's called Barrett's esophagus. Okay, so Barrett's esophagus is a great example of how cells adapt. Okay, so um, Barrett's esophagus happens in people with um, gastroesophageal reflux, um, reflux disease. So we call that GORD or GORD, right? Um, and what really happens in GORD is that um, because there's constantly acid just coming up, coming up your esophagus, um, I would imagine that you know if you're if you're in a soft um, esophageal cell and there's constantly just acid just in your face the whole time, right? I think it would be pretty stressed. So um, you can you can imagine that that's a lot of like um, chemical stress 
on the esophageal cells. And uh, what, what exactly happens is that from um, squamous um, epithelial cells in the esophagus, um, they, um, they start to adapt to this, um, they start to adapt to this, uh, to this form of stress. They undergo metaplasia, which is right here. Um, they undergo metaplasia and they, con and they transform from uh, squamous, cell squamous epithelial cells to columnar epithelial cells, which are the same cell type that are present in the stomach, which constantly has your stomach acids in there, um, kind of churning around, and therefore, um, and therefore these columnar, columnar epithelial cells are actually impervious to stomach acid. So you can really see that your esophagus is like, okay, if we're, if we're going to constantly be having this backwash of acid um, going up and down and up and down the whole time, we are going to take some protective measures, become like the stomach, become like the stomach, and um, not be susceptible to this acid backwash. Okay, so yeah, that's a great example of how um, of how constant stress, um, yeah, constant stress can cause cells to just adapt. Okay, and um, so other forms of uh, um, adaptation would be atrophy, decreased cell size. Um, I read somewhere that um, okay, well. I don't remember the exact statistics, but basically if um, you're an old person or you, you know an old person and they're lying in bed, um, being bed bound for even just three weeks can take a huge toll on the person's muscle mass. So, um, which can prove really, um, really to, to really be very um, dangerous to people, especially like athletes who are injured and then have to be bed bound. Like that can, that can really like affect their career. So um, it's just really sad. There's also hyperplasia, sorry, hyperplasia is right here. Hi, my messages are blowing up. There is also hyperplasia right here. Um, hyperplasia means increased cell number, um, increased cell number. So yeah, that is increased cell number. My messages are blowing up. Okay, and there's also hypertrophy. Um, hypertrophy is right here, so increased cell size. Fun fact, that's actually what we want to happen in our muscles. Um, so if you are looking to, um, so if you guys are looking to have like gains and stuff, right, um, I have read, I've did, done a bit of reading because, you know, quarantine workouts, but um, good hypertroph hypertrophic workouts are heavy weights, um, low reps. So that actually helps your muscles get used to, you know, the stronger weight. And that, um, yeah, that causes hypertrophy in your muscles. So cool stuff, you know, you, you can get, you can get um, ripped in your brains and ripped in your, uh, in your muscles. Um, I've gone through atrophy and this metaplasia, which I've also gone through. It's the example where um, one cell type is probably going to want to convert into another cell type that may be a bit more resilient, a bit tougher. And yeah, so that's basically it. If my messages would stop blowing up, that would be really great. Um, so that's basically it. Thank you guys for sticking around for this session. Um, if you guys uh, like the stuff we're doing, please, please, please subscribe, like this video, and also join our Facebook group, um, which is in the link in description below. If you would like access to these slides, um, they're also in the link in the description below. And also, um, if you guys um, have any questions, don't hesitate to DM us. Um, we can be found on Facebook in the Facebook group, which you guys might, um, which you guys might want to join. And that's it. I'll see you guys next week. Bye.